Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first lecture of in our Open Heritage series um, for the academic year 2018 and 19. And it's my great pleasure to welcome my Barclay colleague, Professor Maureen Fraser, to deliver his contribution on creative design in the views of historic buildings and urban areas. Just to say a few words about Murray, he is Professor of Architecture and Global Culture at the Barclay School of Architecture, as well as the Vice Dean of Research for the, Bar for the whole of the Barclay Faculty of the Built Environment. He has published extensively on design research, architectural history and theory, urbanism, post-colonialism, and cultural studies. In 2008, his book on architecture and the special relationship was given the RIBA President's Research Award and the CICA's Bruno Zabi Book Prize. I think Murray is very well equipped to talk to us about creative design in the historic environment, and we really look forward to launching our guest lectures this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, first of all, I just want to check you can see the screens. If, if we need the lights to come down, please just say, because it's probably important you see those. Um, it's very, very nice of me and our team to invite you to come and talk in this series. I really realize this is very much the center of expertise in the subject um, I'm about to talk on. And so what I want to do is maybe just give a different viewpoint, maybe one that's more personal to myself as an architect and an architectural historian. Um, and so what I want to do is really kind of focus on this notion of um, I, what I would say is a change in culture in the, in the attitudes of architects and I'm going to be talking very much from an architectural sort of point, point of view um, about the reuse of historic buildings and historic areas as the kind of the, as, the, as the ground as the stuff of innovative design. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I, I want to talk about. Um, and as I said in the introduction to, to the notes, I'm sure on, on environmental, on social and cultural grounds, this idea of reusing, of keeping uh, existing buildings, existing urban environments is pretty much, you know, a, a, now an unassailable case. Uh, whether we're doing enough, whether what we're doing is right, might be another question. But, you know, it's, it would seem hard to be able to now argue against the retaining of uh, a substantial part of our uh, historical fabric. Um, whether this will continue in the future, indefinitely, we don't know. We can't say what the future is going to bring. But nevertheless, it seems for the moment, it seems very unlikely that somebody's going to reverse that at any time soon. So that seems to be well established. We have very well established uh, principles of, um, of conservation, preservation, etc., listing, etc., describing these things, caring for buildings, caring for artifacts, etc. Um, but as I say, I think what I, I really so I thought I could just bring up for discussion here is a kind of a sort of change in architectural thinking itself. So the way how architects also uh, think about these issues of reusing historic buildings and environments, etc. Um, and I would say, broadly speaking, in my career, so I'm now uh, obviously more senior uh, in my in my career, etc. But certainly from when I was starting out as a young architect and as a young academic, uh, there was a very different uh, approach to the uh, this idea of working with historic buildings historic areas really it was seen probably even when I was sort of qualifying in the 1980s as something that was slightly aberrant something that was not necessarily the main thrust of what architects ought to do that somehow you know to be a proper architect one had to design a new build building one had to have a free site and then make one so original contribution without um, and the help of a previous um, designers or previous builders etc and then there's very much seen, I mean, if I was building cancer, it's sort of, sort of secondary. Working with historic buildings, working with historic years, was somehow secondary to something that might be called real architecture. And obviously, I'm talking here very much from a sort of uh, British West Western perspective, etc. It might have res re re resonance with people in other parts of the world. But that was very much how the kind of the mentality um, went. Um, and now I would suggest, if, certainly from my reading of what's happening in, in, in Britain and also other places around the world, is that there's been a really quite major sea shift uh, to the point now when really, in many ways, uh, a lot of the very best artists, the people you might think are really there pursuing, so we say, the more creative, most innovative design, are also now engaged in 
reusing old, uh, working with old buildings, etc. Um, and also, we I think I mean, my case, which I would often put, is actually if you actually look at those architects, and I'll mention a few later, you can actually say that it's their better work, their the most creative work, the most original work, is now when they're actually working with uh, historic buildings and, and existing environments rather than, shall we say, external design or projects. And anyway, so that's really what I just want to raise up. You might disagree with me entirely. Please say so at the end if you do. But nevertheless, it does strike me that there is something definitely going on. I can't say I've got all the definite answers to this, but I think it's worthwhile at least marking this and maybe wondering why this is happen, happening as well. Um, I think it's also the case in uh, academia as well. Again, I'm not, some of you will be academics, some of you won't be as well. But I remember when I was, um, again, a young academic at Oxford Roach University in the 1990s, I started teaching there. There was a program, a master's program. We had several master's programs going in. One, one was called Build Resource Studies. Um, uh, and it was set up, and I think at the time it was the first architectural masters that really looked at issues of reusing uh, existing buildings and the issues involved in there. As I say, a lot of the arguments we now associate uh, uh, with you know, sustainability and other reasons for that as well. They made a very good case for that, etc. But this program, even though it was part of our suite of masters, etc., with an architecture school, made it pretty clear that it wasn't really interested in innovative architectural design. The students were not required really to kind of pursue the same level of investigation and testing and creation and innovation that the other students were. And the people running the course, I think, were quite open about the fact that that was not their job, you know, that wasn't the stuff. Uh, this was a sort of pragmatic, practical, uh, social reason and not a, an architectural one. And I think that's, uh, again, that was an attitude I think was quite prevalent then. There was a, uh, a sort of distrust of what architects did, and maybe, and then also, as I was saying, a disinterest in architecture and working with older buildings. But again, I think that's changed now as well. I think we really find a lot of people are now really uh, see um, both ways, you know, that this is actually an area in which, you know, there's a lot of innovative speculative design can happen and lots of things can be tested out, etc. And that really it has become really part of the, uh, the stuff of just the general architectural discourse altogether, etc. And I'll mention briefly, therefore at the end, a new course that uh, we set up in the School of Architecture here at the Bartlett a few years ago in, in the, the Masters of Architecture and Historic Urban Environments. And I'll say a little bit about that and how that seems to market it, what we feel is part of this change, etc. Okay, so that's really the sort of the, just really the, hopefully the basis of really what I'm going to say. Um, in terms of the actual content of this, I thought it might be useful to offer a, mod, a, a kind of an overview, maybe a sort of kind of model of this kind of changes in this attitude, where, where and why it happened. And as I say, this is not meant to be a definitive thesis. This is just really a sort of a proposition about the kind of the, the changes that one can observe in the way in which architects, and again, looking from an architect's point of view, have looked at this issue of having to deal with historic buildings and historic environments. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to mark four stages of change, change uh, broadly speaking, from the 19th century onwards. The first one is a state of pathos, uh, which I'll explain. The second one, that one of juxtaposition of elements. Uh, the next one, symbiosis. And then the fourth one will be a sort of an emphasis on this idea of urban life, on the contribution to contemporary urban life. So th those are going to be the ones I I, I talk about, and, and as I say, this is just like a heuristic device. This is me offering a kind of some possible overview for how this change took place. Um, if we look at this sort of, um, and obviously, what well, the point obviously to make here very, very clearly is obviously cultures from all over the world for a long period of time have reused and rehabilitated old buildings. Uh, they've reused materials from old buildings, as we know, spolia from from ancient Rome and, and, and lots of different cultures there. So this is a long-standing thing there, but this seems to be. <coughs> What I'm able to talk about is sort of a change in sort of uh, uh, within the era after industrialization, within what we might see as more a general contemporary cultural condition, etc. Where do these kind of changes happen, etc. And in the 19th century, you can see with the with the drawings of John Ruskin uh, looking at Venice, etc., or Philip Webb and William Morris looking at uh, vernacular buildings in Britain, etc., and the farm buildings, and then trying to translate them into buildings like the Red House here, which I'm sure you all know this uh, stuff well. Um, it, was a, it was seen as a kind of a state of shock in what was happening under industrialization, that there was a, a, a major social and economic transformation going on, there was mass urbanization, there was a revolutionary people's um, uh, um, uh, Conditions of everyday life, etc. You know, people were uh, moving into cities, losing front of the past, 
uh, demolition, rampant rebuilding was happening, etc. There was what might be seen now is this um, kind of reaction, a sort of a kind of a, a cultural reaction to these kind of changes, etc. Um, there was an interest amongst uh, Ruskin, obviously, Morris, and things like conservation, etc. You get the first in Britain, certainly the first conservation bodies, etc. And then there was an empathy with older buildings, but it was also it strikes me, it was a sense of loss. There was a sense that something had changed and something was wrong, and that the situation was one of um, a sort of pathos. And there was a kind of a sense that, you know, that somehow modernity, the new force of industrialization would sort of sweep away um, uh, what, what had been built up in cultures previously, etc. Um, and it, it's, it's very interesting to how some of the architects um, react to this as well. There's a, an architectural historian, some of you might know, called Timothy Bruce Catherine, who's a kind of specialist in 19th century and, and then early 20th century. Uh, British architecture, um, and also uh, a conservationist. He's, he's chair of the 20th Century Society now, etc. And he's been quite active in trying to map these kind of architects in the 19th century who were trying to think about how to deal with this condition, this kind of this, this condition of loss, etc., and, and of threats. And he points out that George Stevie, who was uh, one of the NACO uh, uh, rival architects, designed a, a number of structures with these traces has been very. Uh, amongst the first of the, sort of the more contemporary, more modern buildings to think about this idea of how one dealt with the residue of the building uh, from the historical past. One of which includes this, it, uh, this was a new build and the state he was working on and he was asked by the client to build a new house and he built essentially, obviously, a building in the, might be seen very much as the British, but act of uh, a revival tradition, etc. But it also has this, it's a built myth as well. It was a kind of story of architectural history because it's, it's, it's essentially brick built on stone, but the, it looks as if somehow there was an existing stone building and the, the brick building kind of mounts out of it. But in fact, this was entirely a um, new build at the time. So Divi was building a kind of sort of a history of this idea of a reuse of, a, of an existing building, etc. So trying to express this idea of a, of a, of a cultural continuity in his work. Um, and then Tim also mentions this building. This is actually a rather curious building. So this one he points out, this is by somebody called Lees. He can't work out who the architect is. Probably the borough architect of St. Pancras, uh, but we don't know that for sure. And then Lord Carrington, who had an interest in, 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 in town, etc., obviously hired somebody called Lees to redesign the Lees house at, um, at Dollars Hill House in High Wycombe, etc. And, and, and it was obviously a, a fairly well-to-do house as well appointed, lots and lots of spaces, but rather than building a new uh, building, what, what the architect did was to take several existing cottages in the villages and basically bolted them together uh, with connections, etc. And again, this idea was rather curious. So this is, a, I guess, a, an architecture of, of, of uh, wealth, of plutocracy, but somehow masquerading as, as a kind of a, as an ensemble in an English village, etc. So there was a, definitely a kind of sense of interest in the past, you have this sort of an interest in archaeology, etc. Um, and probably another kind of classic example of, of, of this kind of transition, this would be something that Charles Robert Ashby, C.R. Ashby, again, uh, one of the um, uh, sort of an vernacular architect, a uh, rival architect, etc., who uh, set up the Guild of Handicraft to try and train uh, young apprentices in the East End, uh, uh, sort of building skills and other um, uh, craft skills, etc. Uh, there and then in the uh, around about 1902, uh, relocated down to Chipping Camden, famously in the Cotswold, etc., moved into the old silk mill and then transformed that, you know, from a, an old previously industrial building that was then disused and then turned it into a new uh, space of kind of uh, craft production, etc., and, and sort of re repurposing the building from that, etc. But again, <coughs> in this sense, you know, that there was a sense of handicraft of. Of, of, of kind of care of labour, etc. Ruskinian care of joint labour being lost uh, due to industrialisation. Um, Ashley, as you probably know, is also very, uh, had many different strings to his bow, but one of the things he was involved in was the formation of the Survey of London. Um, this is the first parish volume, it came out in 1900 on probably the bow. Um, uh, we have two members from the uh, Peter Gilly and Colin Tom from the Survey of London here. This, uh, they were pointing out there was a monograph that had been published before, but this is the first of the classic survey um, uh, parish uh, studies, etc. But uh, this was very much uh, also uh, Ashby's and other people was concerned that somehow London was being re redeveloped, etc. And very soon the historical uh, residue of London would be erased by industrial development as well. So, and then the Survey of London will come into the story again later. Um, 
And again, this idea of a sort of the pathos, etc., this idea of the kind of the history somehow lost, abandoned, left behind, somehow, um, uh, somehow it's an act right, etc., and, 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 and discontinuous from contemporary civilization, and also it's also very well expressed. And this is just represented, so we can find other examples, but this is the Camusé's plan for a safety in France after the, the Second World War. This was the first attempt to go instead of unity, it didn't come off, and the scheme was rejected. But nevertheless, you've got this kind of urban continuum there, and you can just about see the old church, etc. And there was a planned uh, redevelopment for the Spanish town. The France was basically engulfed all the historic pattern in a, in, a kind of, in, a, in a sort of a new uh, form of urban and architectural construction, etc. With the, the buildings left like sort of dead fish on a plate, etc. So if that was the kind of first idea, this pathos, this sort of, sort of discontinuity, this inability really to deal with, uh, you know, create engage, uh, engagement. There are obviously exceptions, etc. So I'm talking so quite broadly here. There are the next phase, I would say, is one probably more of what might be called juxtaposition. Uh, so they're no longer so worried about the the loss of history. This was, uh, I think, this was uh, really stemmed by a lot of the kind of major social and political. Uh, 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 transformations in the, the 20th century, the Great World Wars, etc. Uh, but certainly for um, uh, after the sort of uh, after the First World War, etc. There was a kind of a greater interest in this idea of uh, of incorporating historical buildings and fabrics into the into the architectural kind of uh, production of contemporary times, etc. And it, these are two kind of examples. And then with this a kind of a an, an evoking of, of the kind of past history, a sort of parallelism. A kind of a, a, a coexistence, shall we say, of the kind of older and the new ones, and obviously two uh, bomb churches which are, you know, on either side of the, uh, the Second World War. This is sort of just like the Second World War in Berlin and in Coventry, and again, I'm sure you know those buildings as well. But this, this idea of the two forms of architecture so just sitting there, not quite engaging, etc., but at least uh, now openly coexisting almost as equals, etc. Uh, probably the, the one of the, the main figures who really strikes me, one of the most interesting figures who seemed to be uh, quite quite um, uh, innovative at, at that time in terms of this idea of, 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 of placing older and newer forms of architecture together would be Joseph Plechnik, the Slovenian architect who was obviously trained in Vienna, worked for Wagner uh, and then went to Prague and um, also then returned. And in Prague he was asked to do the additions to the Prague Castle uh, by the new President under the first, uh, you know, the Republic was known as Czechoslovakia, created after the First World War, after the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and so he gets asked to to make these intersections into the, the fabric and, and very much allowing the fabric to be what it was, and then inventing his own uh, kind of um, uh, sort of um, very original, sometimes based on myth, etc., sort of allegorical uh, kind of insertions into the uh, into the fabric of the castle was a project he worked on for many years, etc. Um, uh, and then, it, probably even more strikingly, when he, once he returned to, um, to Ljubljana, where, where he was the place of birth, etc., he, uh, he, he signed a number of fascinating projects there, and every was Ljubljana, you know, uh, just how much excellent architecture is my place, but particularly in this uh, building here, this is the National Library, somewhat delayed, designed in the third or something. To the party on, etc. But this is one a building which there had been a previous palace on the side, which was then being pulled down. But what Plexney did was to take the stones from that palace and then bend them uh, quite carefully into the into the new brick uh, skin of, of, of the library that he was doing. So very much emblematic, but again, very much showing that there's an equivalence to, but there's sort of a, a contrast between the two parts of the architecture between the uh, the older stone that's been recycled and then this new. A form of architecture uh, that he was he was creating himself. Um, again, probably the most famous, you know, Plexi was a really kind of important sort of early for, for, for another one that architect that certainly when I was uh, going to architecture training, the architect was very often brought up as the example of somebody who was, um, you know, a very, very adept of and very, very thoughtful individual in working with historic buildings would be Carlo Scarpa. Uh, uh, and obviously his most famous project is the Castle of Reggio uh, in, in Verona, etc., which he used in the historic building, partly restored, but then also bits were removed and new insertions were, were made to turn it into the museum, uh, very open use of concrete, etc. But again, it strikes me very much in this ball of that there was a, a, a very careful, thoughtful, you know, 
ju juxtaposition really of elements really of the, the two stay very much apart from each other. This is, a, I don't know if you've seen the book by Richard Murphy, a fantastic study of the, the kind of, uh, um, of the transformations that um, Scarborough made there, etc. But the way in which he kind of, you know, previous the historic fabric, retained so much, served so much, but then was quite uh, open in adding in the assertions. Again, very, very light. Generally, uh, again, differentiated sort of, uh, Design-wise, and psychologically differentiated from the existing fabric, so you could tell uh, what was uh, old and what was new there uh, as they coexisted together. And again, probably somewhere else, another kind of well-known example from the 1960s would be the Bensburg Town Hall by Godfrey Ball, and then and his sort of wife Elizabeth, and he tended to do that exterior architecture, and she was responsible for the interior design. But nonetheless, again, you can see this idea of it trying to. Uh, integrate itself into this historic town, but again, with this very clear sense of differentiation between these two parts uh, sitting together. Uh, and, and so, if that was kind of a uh, period where there was an open sort of, it strikes me a, a sort of a, more of an openness and a respect, etc., and a playing off between them, there, there was a, a further change, I think, which really changed was I would call it something more like a symbiosis. And this would be when, when the a much more diametrical creative uh, relationship and interchange between the, sort of the older elements and the newer elements. So rather than accepting that these two parts could be placed together and you know sort of sit respectively separate each other, but they could actually start to cross personalize each other. And then, and then I would sort be you know, the, so the, in some ways there were some some quite key changes and obviously the history of modern architectural thought is, is a very complex thing and there are different kind of periods etc and people sort of often draw and the same between you know modernism as up to 75 and then postmodernism therefore after etc. But in reality <coughs> there were overlaps etc. There were a lot more different points of view within uh, and modern architectural thinking even the period before there and probably the two well there's a couple I've mentioned but one of the figures was something like Louis Pan, the American I was so called American architect um, and he um, and his, his, his work tended not to involve actually historic, using historic buildings, historic sites much, but he was fascinated, as you'll probably know, by the, by the cultural residue of the ancient, the buildings of ancient Rome. He did famous, <coughs> you know, probably successful modern architecture up to the point he then went to study in American uh, school in Rome, the American Valley in Rome, and then became fascinated by this idea of the power and the strength of these ancient uh, Roman buildings, which he felt could not just be seen historically, but could actually be used as a kind of sort of creative resource for contemporary architects. And so these were things that could be absorbed and thought about, etc. And he's, it's a very beautiful quote about this idea of these thought about wrapping ruins around buildings, that somehow these buildings would have this kind of, both this sense of something new, of being of, of this centre as well, but also having these echoes of, uh, of, of being um, also alluding to far ancient times, etc. or certainly having a feeling of um, something being uh, ground down and uh, eroded and changed and transformed over time. This is the Institute of Management in Maribad, one of his uh, famous projects. Uh, it's it's everybody, uh, one of his two major projects in the Indian subcontinent. Um, and this was just an example of the way in which he was trying to argue for a sort of a, a, an acceptance of the deeper history of architecture, but also a sense in which that then becomes uh, a creative force for architecture now. So um, Louis Cam was one figure. Um, another one would be probably another really influential figure. At the time was Aldo Rossi, uh, the Italian uh, Marxist uh, rationalist architect, etc., who, whose interest in, in the past and historic um, uh, buildings was actually uh, much, much, much far different to Louis Cam's. I mean, he was interested in this notion of buildings as a virtue of collective memory, etc., of the, the kind of lives and all the experiences of, of, of the people who lived in the city and built those cities there. And he felt there was a sort of an analogous city, there could be another city other than the one that was actually physically built under post-war Italian uh, capitalism. Uh, that, you know, that there were these kind of forms and kind of memories, etc., that the architect could draw upon and use to create even his, uh, uh, their contemporary buildings, etc. So this was a kind of a, uh, a more sort of psychological uh, kind of um, uh, used to the past, and he says in you know, the old bodies of cities, his book of the architecture of the city uh, in the mid 60s has seen as one of the key turning points of this idea of architects really rethinking their attitude towards the kind of their, the residue of, 
of history of, of kind of uh, historical buildings and just in their own cities and their work, etc. Um, and then these kind of beautiful drawings here, this idea of you know this kind of overlaying of history that, that there was these kind of elements that was, you know carried through to the, the, the present day, etc. Alvin Rossi. Um, Later on, they probably know the kid more and more about him. Some of course, one is his architectural expression, but he wasn't so much at this point. It was very much more a broader, so not not so aesthetically driven kind of idea that there was a historical depth that the architects should draw upon in their work, etc. And then that sort of kind of approach in Italy uh, really sort of uh, meant that uh, they began to emerge a few architects who really were seen as you know, very, very uh, top leading architects amongst the architects in Europe, and, and then they were really trying to transform uh, the way in which modern architects work by uh, openly reusing uh, historic buildings. In this case, this is the magisterial part of the uh, Urbino University, designed by Giancarlo de Gallo, who basically was behind the design of uh, this idea of regenerating this rather beautiful kind of bit uh, economically. Uh, 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 sort of uh, impoverished Italian hill town into a um, uh, sorry, Marshall hill town into a into a, a university centre, etc. This is a beautiful kind of building which kind of you know it has a very very uh, plain street facade and then this this, this sculpted interior here with a auditorium, etc. Which forms this sort of uh, roof garden, which gives you a beautiful view out over the the hills, etc. And so um, and then the way we said. You, uh, Jeff Carlo de Carlo sort of uh, willingly embraced this use of these historic forms and, and, and these kind of sites and the, and the given topography of the site, etc., to make very much his part of his uh, architectural inspiration. So he's another one of those kind of figures, you know, even at a time when there were relatively few uh, people, but he was uh, very much trying to do that. And then a very different kind of uh, example, just to show that, you know, that it wasn't just European as well, it would be some of Lino Bombardi. In Brazil, who who was who was uh, towards her, her career, so in the nineteen eighties was given a project really to to, to take an old uh, concrete factory and a concrete factory and it creates a sort of leisure sports centre uh, for 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 a sort of a, a social group uh, in, in Brazil, etc. And then it was a mixture of reusing the building and creating these new concrete towers with the with the bridges across, etc. But a very kind of a resonant work, and uh, this kind of work. Okay, this is um, <coughs> some of the designs from the 70s, and, and, and built through into the 80s. This project had in various phases, etc. But I remember this making an absolute uh, huge uh, impact at the time, not least because it was very much about this idea of the occupation by human beings taking a previously what we see as an industrial, tough, uh, you know, dirty kind of side of making a place for play around relaxation etc and so if that was kind of um, this idea of the symbiosis um, this uh, kind of um, it, you know it's a really gradual movement and then I think that to the certain point as I was saying before that if you actually look at a number of what might be seen as the amongst the most uh, you know top the the most respected architects in various countries around the world as I say Many of them are actually either doing mixture, obviously, of new buildings and, and working with old buildings, but generally speaking, probably they're working with older buildings are, are their more interesting, the more stimulating uh, kind of buildings. And this is uh, Peter Zumter, the Swiss architect, uh, who, who uh, in the Columbia Museum was dealt with uh, an old uh, historic building there, and then he actually absorbed fragments also from other buildings, etc. So it wasn't just uh, this, this part of this building here or there. But here, this seems to be an almost deliberate attempt to seamlessly mix the, the two in, in together to basically slide the kind of old and the new to dovetail it to really sort of embrace them so that they sort of work uh, symbiotically with each other etc. Uh, there's the kind of the, the old masonry uh, tradition there, this is the sort of plan etc. Uh, 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 um, Zoom to Pimsy also has approached a Danish brick manufacturer to have a special new type of brick called the Columba uh, designed for this uh, uh, for this project etc. What they kind of evolved Kind of an older tradition of, of brick making, etc. They're more resonant, uh, more resonant for the urban fabric, etc. So even the materials of the of the, the fabric he was using for these new insertions were somehow was meant to be influenced by the older uh, building as well, and then the sections there. So we've got there. I mean, probably another famous example again of a, an architect who's uh, you know is seen as one of the the most accomplished or something, David Chipperfield. Um, you know, his, his projects, um, you know, are, are generally well 
perspective, but probably none other. I mean, probably the one that's really hit the the the, the, hit, the um, uh, hit the highest point in terms of its reputation is the um, the, the noise museum in Berlin, etc. Again, a building from the mid 19th century, which was sort of restored, keeping the old. Uh, fabric as much as possible when putting in new insertions, etc. A very, very controlled project, enjoying the kind of the, the inclusion of of, 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 of of the fragments of the old, etc. Drawn up in a way that seems to be very much saying, you know, he's very, very happy to see some of the continue. He's seeing obviously is an architect who's probably have have your work within the kind of a neo classical idiom, etc. But uh, no, this was uh, was was a, uh, obviously a much. Uh, lauded building, etc. Probably, I would say, probably more uh, generally appreciated by architects than, than a lot of the other more recent projects, etc. I've seen this one which really seemed to fit his kind of rather measure of rather cool restraint, you know, such so like a neoclassical kind of approach, which can generally seem rather cold and really kind of unwarded new building somehow in that building work well. Uh, then this is another building here was again I think was really quite instrumental in this idea of what you could do with taking a historic building um, uh, and, and, and giving it a new uh, a, 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 a lease of life. This is the French architect uh, Lacatan de Salle with that Lacaton really is the kind of a, in many ways the main driving design partner. This was a sort of a fairly uh, severe neoclassical building in Paris, um, opposite the uh, Eiffel Tower on the side of the river, etc. And what Lacan and Massal really did was a kind of was a, a, a supreme job of this idea of stripping the building back down to its absolute essentials. And again, uh, with, if, if, if um, the Chiffre was, was really trying to make it feel like a, an old 19th century neoclassical building, Neres was really to try and create this idea of a new uh, art gallery space, etc. This idea of a kind of uh, a, a peel back, very rough and ready, kind of quasi industrial uh, kind of feel that they were giving to this building, which uh, 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 which really kind of suits the kind of um, architect's collections. Again, taking the main kind of you know, classical plan and just adding in very few uh, minor insertions there, etc. But um, really, sort of enjoying the kind of this new fact aesthetic uh, by stripping back the building and treating it. To, in this very raw, bare state, etc., um, with obviously some years for foyers, etc., um, and for restaurants, etc., but also uh, using some of the undercroft areas for uh, places to display street art and then other things that really so much enjoying this kind of idea of this, of this building as, as a resource that can be re creatively reused, etc. Um, uh, this is a, 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 a this one from May. Uh, she's not gone, unfortunately. But anyway, but this is uh, obviously this is another example of another architect who we see as kind of you know you know amongst the, the very most top respected architects in the world, um, Renzo Piano. Um, gets a lot of criticism for his uh, new builds, etc. So a lot of people find the Shard not necessarily the best building in the world, etc. So but it's very interesting to think as well as uh, doing that. Uh, kind of architecture as well, he did the work of this project for this new entrance into the letter in Walter, etc., which uses very much you know, to to uh, that site, etc., this amazing drop in the level, etc., of this old sort of fortified city, etc., as you come across the bridge with a huge uh, boat in the way, etc., and there's some sort of an architecture that seemed to uh, talk about uh, uh, ramparts, etc., of trying to re establish this kind of slightly, um, uh, slightly the city edge, etc. So it's a building that marks an entrance, but also talks very openly about this idea of a stone tradition, but also using new technologies like uh, and digital cutting of stone, etc., to create this thing. Part of the building involves retaining an old force, um, etc. But the here's some is an architecture which seems to me, certainly in terms of perhaps what type of sort of a level of interest and sophistication, he's always been involved to some extent in. In, in, in conservation restoration work in general, pretty uh, based uh, where it comes from. But you know, that here it seems to be a real job in some using a lot of those techniques in this uh, uh, very sort of innovative uh, way here as well, and, um, and 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 the way which it kind of uh, stitches into the city. And then it strikes me that there's, this is this final phase of which we was talking about. Since it, if it were the criticisms of, of the kind of other buildings like the, the Chipfield one or um, the zoom draw ones, etc., they tend to be objects themselves, so they're really kind of projects uh, isolated themselves. There's another sense in which I think that the, the, 
uh, architects don't actually enjoy this notion of buildings as being part, more of a sort of an urban continuum, etc., and having a relationship with the um, with the city around them, etc. And it strikes me this, in some ways, this is uh, the, the most interesting part of the piano scheme is, is not just the building itself, but also the way in which it links all the spaces around it and makes this new uh, walkways, etc., around it. So it's urban space around it, etc. And then I think the same sort of um, idea of uh, this idea of buildings that somehow you know we also want to have a sort of an urban impact as well, an urban dimension would be exemplified probably by the architects in many ways, which really kind of to me exemplify this idea of a new kind of attitude towards the creative new use of the stock building. So we seem very, very at uh, ease with it, etc. Doing on one hand uh, new build projects, uh, which again I would argue very, very uh, uh, are not as successful really as the projects that they work on now when they're actually working with it. An old building, obviously, famously, the, the, the refurbishment of the Tate uh, turbine hall um, into the, into the uh, uh, old turbine hall, so backside turbine hall into the Tate bottom, etc. There's obviously the latest uh, addition, the, the, the extension to it as well. But this idea of a kind of a taking the space inside of the building to create a kind of quasi urban, kind of open, so, social space, etc. So, this is really about an architecture that really wants to talk about it, something that being used. An urban condition and also being used as a as a site of spectacle, etc., a, a, a place where other things happen. So the, the architecture becomes a framework, I think, really for other kind of uh, uh, activities to happen, really rather than something just to be done and venerated by itself, etc. Um, <coughs> and then another one I think would be uh, in the in fact, if you look at the kind of house uh, entrepreneur work, the Kaiser Forum in Madrid, which was a kind of an interesting and honestly, uh, you know. It's distinguished a building, etc., and which is sort of undercut the building, create new roots through it, form a new gallery site, and then extend up uh, the top of the content steel at the top there. So, sort of take the existing form and then again, like like the uh, Zoom building, to sort of somehow want to see be visually sort of mixing uh, these two, uh, embracing them both together, making them touch and dovetail into each other here and uh, there as well, and as well as enjoying. The retention of the kind of the uh, older parts, the older elements of the building, etc., in a very open way, but a way that's really about you know, giving sort of a, a visual pleasure on the urban scene. This is the uh, the, the section that you can see really with the way we just cut through the underside of the of the block, etc., to allow this sort of free movement through and obviously insert various buildings underneath the ground. Uh, so it's a very sort of uh, quite bold, very simple, but quite bold and very confident kind of reuse of the building and then famously with the the, the, the sort of dream mall, etc. It's just a kind of you know, it's a kind of new vertical garden right beside the um, beside this kind of their, their building there as well. So again, this idea of testing out something like the um, green walls, etc. Doing so in a uh, in a normal setting, etc. And enjoying this kind of mixing of these uh, two elements together. Um, but probably the um, uh, the building that really. Um, Probably sort of marks this thing out. I mean, you could actually say that in many ways, Hudson and Moon are just about just about the most uh, successful architects in the world. I mean, there's are uh, obviously different levels of how you might try to judge it, etc. But you know, in some ways, they're kind of the most uh, celebrated building, and probably the most uh, significant building that built over the last few years is this building here, the Elf Full of Money, which is right on the front there, on, on, on the harbour front in Hamburg, etc. The new concert hall for the the Philharmonic Orchestra there, etc. This is the building here. It's essentially a, a reuse of a, you know, what's generally seen as a fairly humdrum, you know, good enough, but not really a particularly memorable kind of uh, industrial building below, which is sort of kept as a plinth, etc., uh, which has a lot of the services in the car parking and a lot of the kind of basic services with the new building uh, set above. Uh, sitting above uh, the top, like a sort of a light, etc. But the thing that is interesting is also the way in which it very sort of knowingly, this idea of layering a building on top of another one, also very knowingly talks back to, you know, previous cultures, etc., which had the, the this kind of a habit of, of certainly of layering buildings. Uh, so if you look at the Disneyland's of ancient Babylon, very often they were built on top of each other, like the Ted Mackey in, in Babylon, it was an older building which they gets built on, on top of, by successive. Um, Generation, so it builds up by degrees, and then to get up there, you start to use the little giant staircases, etc., because the building is now being elevated off the ground. Um, and so that's effectively, in some ways, really the kind of the, the kind of the party, really, for the the, 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 the the design for the building here with the existing building, the plinth, the more functional plinth down below, and then this new sort of 
uh, cultural uh, uh, building on top. It's essentially you've got this um, uh, an auditorium with sort of like a nest in the box, this protected thing and wrapped around with apartments and hotels and, and various other kind of uh, functions there. But to get up there, because you've got this uh, existing base, etc., you have to find some way to get people up there. So Jacques Hexon, um, it's going to cost a lot of money, it's been a sort of great controversy, etc. But one of the things that did cost quite a lot of money was this um, giant escalator there, which goes basically from the ground floor up to the fourth floor, uh, or fifth floor. Um, and, um, it, 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 and and Herzog decided that he didn't really want to straight um, escalator, he wanted one with a etc. So that you basically go on this escalator and you will not see the end of it, so you feel like you're uh, don't know where you're going, feel you arrive in heaven uh, because you don't know exactly where you're going, etc. So this kind of at um, a considerable expense, the, the manufacturer managed to build this uh, humpback um, uh, escalator there, etc. And then this is the that's obviously the test model, and this is the, the actual building, etc. So this again, this is sort of the equivalent of that sort of giant staircase on the on the ziggurat there. Uh, but it's also really quite fascinating because in some ways, you know, this is a major new building by. Resort, it cost a lot of money, etc. But enjoying this absolute constraint of actually having to fit into this tiny, tiny slot to this kind of wedge shaped building on the side, etc. Put the building on top, etc. It seems to sort of uh, require this sort of an inventiveness, etc. Uh, from the architects. And um, also, the other thing which they're very keen on now, they've done the tip on as well, is that this level here, which is the sort of junction between the two, it then becomes a, a public uh, path. You know, so it's, it's free for people to go up there and they can uh, have a viewing gallery um, when, when it's not so busy, when they can actually get up there. Um, but nevertheless, that's the idea of that. So there's this kind of sort of uh, viewing platform and that would benefit the Google in Hamburg to go and see all the new harbour redevelopment and also see their cities, etc. And then uh, in the middle there, this kind of, um, you know, a really kind of ambitious kind of new um, auditorium, uh, jelly auditorium <coughs> designed quite, quite you know, kind of precise acoustic grounds and, 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 and very careful pragmatic grounds, etc. There'll be one or two ones that broke away from the mold, and, and this is a, an open reference really to uh, Hans Schubert's uh, Berlin Philharmony, if you know that, that building from, from the 60s, etc., with its like asymmetrical seating in the, uh, the, in the auditorium, etc. This is meant to be a sort of a homage to that, but on a much bigger scale. Uh, and again, this idea of using this project as a way of uh, working with this everybody is, is, is testing what they feel is the, the cutting edge of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, auditorium and concert hall design. Um, and the acoustics are meant to be uh, pretty, pretty spectacular. Um, and again, you can see this idea of this faceting, where you can see the superimposition of all of the seats there, etc. Again, seem to be very much enjoying this kind of, you know, like almost impossibly squeezed plan here squeezed into the, into the site here um, with these new features at the top and again uh, so uh, there's something about it there's a one which uh, Harrison we to use this project and I think particularly to use it as a test bed for lots of uh, testing out new ideas this is new uh, sort of acoustic um, uh, enhanced concrete work is actually going on there and then this idea of the building is a as an urban beacon at night etc here sitting here with, the, with some of the other buildings <coughs> Redevelopment there, but so very, very, very uh, clearly this idea that you know it's both a, a mixture of, of the old and the new, and so somehow that this, if you look at this scene here, you know the most important building is the one which really is the most this idea of reworking of, of creating some form of symbiosis and some kind of interaction with the with the existing uh, building, and the ones that don't do that are somehow the new builds, the ones that you know in theory might be seen as purer or you know. Autonomous can, 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 uh, construction with architects are actually the ones that are less interesting. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's also, I think it's also worthwhile sort of talking very much about buildings, etc. But I think the same kind of idea really applies to quite a lot of urban development now as well, or sort of um, area development now of cities that in some ways it's the reuse of the older parts of the city, the reuse of, of the fabric that actually creates much more. Um, to be popular and, and, and more, what might be seen as more, the more successful schemes, etc. The, 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 the classic example is you'll probably all know as well. This you probably know being here as well. This is the High Line in New York, though a lot of people think it actually did look better like this. This is, great. I mean, this is the High Line before it happened. Uh, but I mean, but, you know, there's this kind of long term project, etc. And there's this idea of this redundant elevation uh, railway line, etc., which then gets turned into this long linear power which feeds through. Manhattan, etc. But um, the way in which you know the kind of the the use of um, 
the kind of the architecture frames the, the city, etc. It seems to be very much this another one of these schemes that's almost pathologically dependent on the rest of the city to get to get its meaning. It wants to look at the city, it wants to be seen, etc. and be generated. So it's very much sees itself as a piece of urban continuum in the way in which the kind of the existing structures and existing things have really become the aesthetic you know, kind of core of the whole project is, you know, the, the architects have tried to relatively uh, put it as little as possible, etc., to reuse the existing and to create this new environment, etc., but to sort of use the quality of the existing architecture there, um, which is then amplified at night, etc., and there's a kind of space there as well. And also, there's this rather curious phenomenon, so rather than having a sort of building that's then landscaped around it, you landscape this thing, and then this is almost like this kind of desperate urge by public developers and other architects, etc., to try and get into the highline action. So that if, if anything, it was um, swallowing it now is the fact that it's become hyper successful, and then there's all these kind of new developments, almost like yeah, jostling to get to become part of it. You know, all these new buildings being built up, it's now being extended even further, etc. But it, I think it's quite interesting, though, that the most successful piece of city planning in something like New York and a lot of other places is when it is now using the you know, historic um, um, elements of the city. Um, <coughs> so you can see that as well, and you can say, well, maybe this is to do with kind of, of um, maybe countries have been through um, industrial development and kind of, um, you know, have, have sort of, you know, reached a certain kind of age and maturity in terms of their architecture. And whereas, you know, some countries like China and other Asian economies, now the shift of capital going over towards the east, these rising economies, these new strong companies, that somehow it's all about new build, new development, it's about all these mega new cities and all this kind of stuff there. But one thing that's really <coughs> sort of interests me from my contacts with Chinese colleagues over the last few years as well is that if you look if you look at what the younger architects are doing, not so much the bigger established architects or the big design institutes are telling you if you actually look at a lot of the more interesting younger architects, they're really interested in this idea of kind of working with historic buildings, of actually working with them, kind of an existing fabric, and kind of a complex urban fabric, because it might be the buildings of, that were built in China, but China was um, not, not actually a colony, but subject to obviously inroads from Western uh, imperial countries, etc. And so uh, uh, somehow this came to a fabric, uh, to cities like Shanghai, etc. Um, and that, that this is actually a uh, kind of resource which uh, really in some ways offers them in many ways that are very, very potent and very, very kind of, uh, 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 kind of prevalent form of, of, of architecture that they, they can then respond to and study and design, etc. So it's quite interesting that quite a lot of the projects being done by this younger group of architects. And this is just to give you one example. This is a young practice, or young age practice now, called the Teller of This House, and the, the Long Museum in Shanghai. And I went to Shanghai a few years ago and I said to all my colleagues there, and architects, Chinese academics and said, what buildings you're going to see in the city? You know, what, what's it's the most interesting building built in Shanghai in the last five years or so? Uh, it was only a few years ago, but you know, and then the whole, everybody always said this one here as well was something that was very strange, you know, because there'd obviously be lots of other architects, lots of other projects going on. But this was, I thought it was rather interesting that this was seen as a, uh, as a really interesting museum. It's got this kind of, you know, uh, a series of kind of vaults, concrete vaults rising up there to form these gallery spaces, etc. It's very much a free flowing space uh, divided with these vault dividers there. But probably the most interesting thing is that it's actually a reuse of, of an old industrial facility, etc. So that one of the reasons why they have the vaults, etc., is that there's some, the architecture retains some of the best elements from the, the old site. It was a kind of place where they used to unload coal and various other kind of goods there, so it was a large depot building, and then these are the hopper heads you can see there in the lower picture there. So in some ways this kind of rather beautiful kind of sail-like structure was a response to, um, you know, some integrating or something responding to these, this, these retained elements of the building there, etc. And then there are obviously the one of the cranes on the, the, the side, etc. So again, the, side of the cranes became part of the architecture or part of the scene. And so the, the, the building there was very much uh, trying to use this as a kind of a, 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 as, as a kind of touchstone, as a kind of location you know, for for the um, for the architectural design going on there. <coughs> this interplay between this kind of this older form of rough form concrete and then these new smoother forms there, um, and then again the, the kind of marking the, the history of the issue during the centre were um, very much openly. And this is so sort of, sort of different from the kind of, sort of cliche we've been getting about the, the types of development going on in China at the moment. So it's really interesting to think, you know, that in places there, not just there, there is also another kind of a, um, 
uh, change going on, etc. And then this somehow this 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 kind of enjoyment of this kind of reusing of these uh, story buildings again gives them a, a, a kind of a, 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 a marker. Um, and uh, so I think it strikes me that, you know, I mean, this, uh, so I wonder why people are doing this, why this, this is happening, and I don't think it's doing, uh, this is sort of changing of this kind of interest in China and other countries. I'm noticing as well, people are uh, working with the older fabric and then using this as their creative uh, springboard. Um, it's not necessarily a moralistic one, but I think it's because there's something to do with this notion of the globalized connect, connection and condition for architects, etc. There's a concern. Most countries about, about what the um, what amount of globalization is doing to establish kind of forms of cultural life and daily life and certain forms of building, etc. There's a, a real concern that people might want to become developed, become wealthier, etc. But they're, they're losing some sort of cultural kind of meaning as well, but at the same time, or a certain some form of cultural certainty. And this is not to say that they don't want to, they want to stick it by us, but they, there's a search really for some kind of. Um, uh, cultural connectivity, I think, with the past culture. And I think, to me, this is really kind of where it strikes me that why, even in, in countries where you might not think that that be the kind of case, it seems to become more and more the kind of thinking amongst the most creative architects, you know, that somehow uh, working with historic buildings, working with historic areas gives them a certain cultural fix, gives them a, a, a link, gives them a richness, I guess, of this. Uh, Related to richness, etc., which you can't get, you know, from other projects, you know, etc. So there's definitely something, you know, something I think definitely going on about an interest in, in this kind of form of architecture and, and, and being uh, supremely creative as well, and, and not something to, you know, that's done uh, just for the sake of doing it. You know, that it adds a, a kind of a dimension to architectural creativity as well. So anyway, we, we don't know for sure, etc., but it definitely seems to be a kind of a some sort of uh, sea change going on, etc. And um, I thought I'd just end really by just saying also that you know the, I can see this happening very much uh, amongst the the Barclay. I mean, obviously I've uh, been teaching here for a few years now, and I've trained here and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's saying that you know that um, uh, we can see it both in amongst our sort of members of staff. You know, if you look at the School of Architecture, something like Neil McLaughlin, uh, uh, who is supposed to be uh, sort of got a, a very well respected uh, practice now, etc. Um, you know, he's uh, working on a range of projects, etc. But if you ever see uh, Neil, he talks about his work, but when he gets really passionate, it's when he really engages with a, a, with a historic building or a kind of a complex historical site, etc. You know, again, you can see that it triggers a lot of kind of, uh, kind of resonances for him, etc., sort of, uh, of, of uh, kind of cultural interpretation, etc. So I thought I'd just mention that this is one of the projects that Neil will teach you part time. He's a practicing architect, teach you part time in the School of Architecture. And again, in the past, one of my students' projects would have been tending to be focused more towards what we see new build ones, etc. Now he's doing a lot of kind of buildings and uh, I've got a very, very kind of, um, you know, kind of rich but quite tricky uh, cultural conditions, etc. He was just shortlisted uh, for the Stoning Prize for his addition to Worcester College in Oxford, which you might have seen, etc. So he's working on this kind of project, but he's also working on this uh, building. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a, it's a new museum and there was a visitor centre in a new town in a, in a small town called Auckland Castle, was up in Bishop Auckland, uh, well, it's, it's, it's in Bishop Auckland, uh, up in County Durham, etc. And this is, this is an old uh, monastic set, uh, settlement. The bishops had, uh, um, had, had a, a collection of art, etc. So it's like a new art gallery, etc. But he's trying to work very much with the kind of the, the existing fabric of this town, with the existing uh, religious buildings there, etc. Uh, there's going to be uh, sort of uh, a, a number of new insertions, some of which are completely new, other ones which are reworking and adding on to the <coughs> existing building, but in a very light way, etc. Um, and then um, this idea of you know, that there these new markers, which are obviously again very, uh, uh, very obviously contemporary. These are lots of older buildings there, etc. But enjoying a kind of a, a language and expression, which is obviously alluding to. Uh, some uh, previous uh, pre-industrial craft traditions and to Gothic architecture, etc. So there's a, a real sense of enjoyment and sort of working uh, with these forms, etc. And then producing this uh, gallery space, this small gallery space for the, um, for the for the for the exhibits, etc. For the kind of the, the, the uh, collection in the um, in the uh, in, 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 in this museum, etc. So, the sort of again, this kind of this enjoyment of this kind of the richness, so we say that this project probably gives them, as opposed to obviously working on very often in other uh, types of commissions, 
etc. Um, so, so there's a number of staff there as well. And I mentioned before, uh, we've now got this new course, uh, redistribution. This is the ME Architecture and Historic Architecture and Historic Urban Environment. So we set this up a few years ago for a number of reasons. One, with the bottom of it, it's generally seen as a school that sort of emphasised uh, perhaps it over too much this idea of, of, of the um, of, of the uh, of the the new and, and, and the, the innovative and the speculative etc. was maybe not seen as um, so interesting in the design work in, in working with historic buildings where we thought well obviously if this change is going on you know the market really should be seen as uh, also be showing interest in this as well so we thought it was a missing part in our kind of architectural psyche etc. But then also the fact we have got this survey of London which have been within this heritage were uh, brought into uh, UCL uh, we were looking for a new home etc. We were delighted to to bring the, the survey of London into the School of Architecture so we began to think well what can what can we do there? We've got this very, very uh, long standing, respected uh, historical uh, uh, survey team going on, these not just historians, historians doing this as well. We've got this kind of design uh, tradition of the Barbell, this idea of <coughs> creative design, how can we put them together? So we decided to devise a program, and again, we've very deliberately called it historic urban environments because, you know, obviously. As architects, most of the designs tend to probably focus more on the building scale, etc. We're more interested in <coughs> seeing this as part of a wider cultural uh, continuum, a, a wider cultural scene. So that's really kind of what we wanted to flag up with this name, etc. Uh, we're going to be going, this is our fourth year, I think it is now. We've only had a few graduates, but this is just showing that this is a scheme that one of the students did out uh, on the first. Uh, a year, etc. And he was uh, he was actually from Kuwait, but he was really fascinated by Cairo and this this problem of the uh, of the homeless uh, unemployed street kids there. So he's starting to imagine how some of the structures in Cairo can be adapted, etc., to create um, places for education, for training, uh, in sort of fairly uh, light, easy way, etc. Um, it was a very 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 good successful project. It won a prize in the World Architecture Festival. And generally, students never win prizes in festivals like this as well. But so I thought, was, thought that was very interesting. But, you know, they obviously touched a real residency with this kind of, you know, fairly uh, high-level kind of judging committee. You know, that it, it was something trying to do something with um, a sort of, a, a, sort of a, a form of uh, urban infrastructure that generally tend to be avoided by architects, etc. And so he was trying to think of a number of locations where you could um, put these new insertions, etc. Very much a kind of like a speculative project, but you know, what could uh, a sort of creative architect now something trying to do something new work with the, these existing urban forms like uh, uh, underneath waterways or other kind of uh, disused buildings, etc. So we had a number of sites around the city. He was doing that there, <coughs> or in the more site, he worked wet me, and other the students there who was uh, Lebanese, what was, was, was uh, slightly dismayed by the decay of the buildings in Tyre, the ancient uh, uh, biblical city of Tyre in southern Lebanon, down beside the Israel border, um, and then so he started to imagine a kind of a range of kind of what he called architecture forms of kind of uh, there's basically just lying to rot at the moment. But could you actually have a form of archaeological investigation that created uh, architectural possibilities as well? So his project was very much about understanding that and even imagining a kind of semi uh, a lot of the, of the historic buildings there have been suburbs or something where. Uh, uh, so below uh, sea, etc. So could you actually have an architecture that really looked at, you know, how to display underwater uh, residues as well? So and so this is just some of the examples of the projects. We've obviously lots of things. But I think what we're trying to do is to sort of capitalise. You know, we feel that there is this kind of change going on, and that there's a, a sort of a, a, an engagement and enjoyment on, and a kind of experimentation now with a lot of people who are working with historic buildings, etc., which complements all the other kind of activities that go along to 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 uh, identify and conserve and protect the buildings etc but the space also for this creative design and so that's what we're very much hoping our our course will feed into thank you very much
They managed to convince Arjun you know, to do a more thoughtful, shall we say, more, more, more kind of, you know, a careful 
thing there as well, but I think you know you find this a very very hard business. I don't know if there's many other councils that are, are doing this as well. I mean, his line, like I say as well, he thinks there's only about three or four effective councils in London. But for your examples, these examples are successful examples. Yeah. Sorry. The examples that yeah. you showed are successful examples. Yeah. Did the local authority play any role in them? Yeah, I think so. I, know, I think uh, Hamburg Camber certainly did. They were very, very involved as well. But there will be a local plan. There's a local plan, but... Will be the initial major document. Yeah. And then there'll be conservation areas and rules. Camden Council planning website, which we're in Camden, is very good as a learning curve for historic buildings. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the camera is one of the four that can be the thing, so, yeah, effective. I mean, most other cameras seem to be <laughs> in battle. Yes. Chief Executive of Historic England. It's, it's interesting that we've talked about local authorities. We haven't talked about the Greater London Authority, which is supposed to have a strategic planning brief. Now, the very nature of 70, 80, 90 story buildings, whatever Lorenzo Piano comes up with next, is that they affect very large areas of the city. And we're not used to a planning system that deals with that. So, a building in Southwark can have a seriously damaging effect on the World Heritage Site in Westminster or in Chiswick on Kew. And that must be a role, well, for us as well, but we are only essentially advisory, for, for a, a larger strategic, whether that's the GLA or in other cities, whether that's, that's the Unitary Council, but a larger strategic plan. We're terrified of strategic planning because, well, for various reasons. And we have a system that responds mainly to the rights of individual developers to develop based on precedent, which, which means it is almost the antithesis of strategic planning. But I think when engineers have created buildings that potentially can affect you know, buildings in London visible from Kent, then we have to have a system that allows us to, to think about these things. 
occasionally, when you get a developer like Arjun, who owns a huge quantity of land and has a very long-term interest, they will be enlightened enough to see that their interests and the interests of, a, of creating a place with historic character or enhancing it actually coincide. But that's, you know, that's asking rather a lot of a system that, that doesn't do strategic planning. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, remember the time when they've seen the planning system was holding back development that we needed new towers, we needed trying to modernize the city, and then there was the release of the points right there, railway stations, etc. Church could be seen as a major mistake. Yeah, well, but it is. You know, so and unfortunately, we seem to be building our public infrastructure out of the profits of development. Yeah. Which then means. Gonna happen, you know yes, I do. Oh I mean, you know, that ought to be a great it's railway it's station. Gone, and it's going to be a huge housing development. Well, it's interesting how we put the creative design into the light picture. Yes. I was really interested in the phrase you used more than once, which was the cultural continuum. And I like that fact of layering. Um, I wondered um, <coughs> whether you would consider the architect almost playing the role of the creator. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's very good. Very good point. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't know if you've been, uh, how much you follow younger architectural practices, I mean, maybe you're involved in this as well, but this is probably the most interesting younger practice of written house assemble, so it's a front of assemble, uh, who basically do creation, they won the Turner Art Prize for a project they did in Liverpool, etc. as well, and their work is, um, you know, architectural at times, but not only architectural, they do exhibitions, they do public engagement work, etc. And that's how you get a feeling amongst the kind of, sort of, a lot of the brighter younger peers coming through, that they realise that it's a slightly narrow view of what architects have done, it's, it's just this old in world, and it's not that interesting anymore. Particularly, I guess, if you're working with a big developer, you're just doing a fairly routine project. And somehow there's a more creative form of practice, uh, which would involve you know, things like this, you know, of actually thinking about the place in the city, about public engagement, etc. And I think most of the more interesting other practices are in that area. I think what you're saying about the change in trends to actually look at historic buildings, yeah. it might be that that is part of a, a learning module that architects want to be considering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps that was really yeah so absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's ever one return prize based on the refurbishment. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's it's quite a lot in that. You know, I think there is, there is a present <coughs> but it's also getting seen as a positive thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.